Well. Well. Are we awake? I reckon we all are. <laughs> Good morning. Um, if you came in a bit late and you have kids and you haven't yet picked up the coloring impacts, they are just over there in the corner so the kids can have something to do during the service this morning. want to welcome you to Palm Sunday. How incredibly it is ex exciting it is this morning to celebrate Easter. So today is known as Palm Sunday. And this, as we saw from the little video for the children before, is Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's the beginning of the Holy Week, the most important week in the Christian calendar. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we just thank you so much for this week, this precious week. Holy Spirit, we ask your moving this morning. May your word go forward. May hearts be open. May ears hear. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was sitting in my office this week, and I realized that since I became a Christian, I have probably heard this I have celebrated 40-ish -ish 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 um, times of celebrating Easter since I became a Christian. And I'm doing the ish, ish, ish because I'm not telling you any more than 40. And so um, I have been celebrating this for a very long time. And I've heard it a lot of times before. And I started questioning myself, do I feel the impact of what this Holy Week means? Do I feel the impact of what Christ did this week for me? Is it still new? Is it still fresh? I mean, this is the most important time of year for Christians. What changes this from a story to heartfelt emotions where we say, wow, wow, Jesus did this for me. Where does it change from a story to being impacting? Years ago, I had this amazing opportunity to go to Israel with my mom, and it was an amazing experience. It was incredible. We got to walk through all the ancient ruins, and we got to go to the Sea of Galilee, and we got to go to Capernaum and Bethlehem and Jerusalem, got to go see Masada, got to go to the Dead Sea, got to see so much. And I encourage you that if you ever had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem, you need to do it. It is life changing. You see, in Australia, we have to go to museums to see what happened in the days of old. But Israel itself is a museum. Everything, everything you see in Israel tells you a story. Now, I want you to understand that I come, at the time I went to Israel, I was living in Canada. I came from a place of snow and ice and igloos and, you know, the whole bit. And our trees in Canada were maple trees and pine trees. So when I saw a palm tree for the first time, I got super excited. I got so excited that I actually took a picture. Now you might think this is really crazy, and the next thing I'm gonna tell you, you know that emoji on our phone that has that funny face like, what? The next thing I'm gonna tell you is I actually put it in my photo album. And not only did I put it in my photo album, I gave it a caption. And the caption was, now you gotta just go with me here, because this is an embarrassing moment for me. The caption was, ancient toothbrush. Okay, all right. So I'm sharing that out of complete humility this morning because not, I had no idea that many years later, not only would I be living in Australia, but that I would have a 
a trailer load of palm branches. All of a sudden, this uniqueness became something that I go, you know, you mow the lawn, we all know it. You sit there to get a nice cold glass of water, and you go, and you hear it fall from the tree. This Sunday, we refer to this Sunday as Palm Sunday. And the reason for this title is because when Jesus took that journey to the gates of Jerusalem where people laid out their garments in tree branches, they were olive branches and palm branches. If you have your Bibles with me this morning, turn to Mark 11. Verse 11, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and they outside and sorry they went and found a cold outside in the street tied at a doorway as they untied it some people standing there asked what are you doing untying that cold they answered as the jesus had told them to and people let them go when they brought the colt to jesus and threw their cloaks over it he sat on it Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. This triumphal entrance of Jesus is recorded in all four Gospels. In every single Gospel, they record this triumphal entrance. And there is a reason for this. There is a reason that each of the writers of the Gospels wanted you to know about this entrance. And the reason they wanted you to know about this entrance was because it was Jesus fulfilling the messianic prophecy that happened 500 years prior to this event. What the gospel writers wanted you to understand was Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Son of God. Zechariah 9.9 says, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was written 500 years before Jesus was going down that path towards Jerusalem. You see, the laying of the cloaks on the ground and the waving of the branches were reserved for kings. We see the first example of this in 2 Kings 9.13, where it talks about a time where Jehu was anointed king of Israel. And when he was anointed, the people quickly took their cloaks off. And they spread it under him. And they began to shout to him. And they blew the trumpet. And they hailed Jehu as king. And as Jesus started this road to Jerusalem... You could hear the disciples praising Jesus. Behold the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds got on board with this enthusiasm and they cut down these branches. And in Canada, because we didn't have palm branches, we used to make these little branches made out of paper. And as kids, we would shake them and say, Hail King Jesus. The crowd said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest in heaven. Hosanna means save us. Perhaps they cried out in that moment because of the excitement of the crowd. You know how you can get carried away with the crowd and everybody's excited and, and the crowd causes that excitement. But they weren't crying out because they understood what Jesus was doing or his purpose. They actually got it all wrong. They were waving their, little, their palm fronds and their olive branches to declare that Jesus was going to liberate Israel. That's what they thought Jesus was there for. Jesus was being greeted by a bunch of people who were thinking that he was going to liberate Israel from the Romans. 
You see, the Roman Empire was very heavy-handed. And the people of Israel were feeling desperately wanting somebody to come and save them from the Roman occupation. They didn't understand that Jesus' purpose of going through those gates of Jerusalem wasn't for that. They weren't crying out because they saw Jesus was going to free them spiritually. They didn't see him as that sacrificial lamb, the savior of the souls. No, they saw Jesus as someone who was going to save them politically. They completely missed the message of Jesus. And the interesting thing is as Jesus was entering in and they were shouting this out and they were, they were praising him and they were going, Hosanna, and they hail to the king. That just a few days later, those same people would be shouting, crucify him. But out of that whole story about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the thing that got me this week, the thing that just dug deep into my heart is that Jesus, as he was on that donkey and people were singing, hail, hail, he knew what was before him. He knew what awaited him. You see, Jesus was fully human. And he was fully God. And by being fully human, he was just like you and me. And he felt every single human emotion that you and I feel. When those people were shouting, Hosanna, 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 he knew that a couple days later they were going to say, crucify him. He felt the betrayal. He felt the abandonment. He felt the stab in the back. He felt the hurt. He felt the sadness. He felt the agony. Because he was fully human. The one thing he did not do is sin with it. He didn't wish those people were out of his life or that they were dead or think of what he could do to get back to them. Nah, Jesus didn't do that. His desire is to love. His desire was to love them. His desire was them to know what he was there about. Why he was there. But you know what? He was also fully God. And by being fully God, he knew what was going to happen tomorrow. He knew what that cross meant. He knew the agony he was going to endure. He knew the whippings and the lashes. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to stand and be tried. He knew Peter was going to deny him. The one that was his best friend was going to turn around and stab him in the back. And say, I don't know him. He knew that because he was fully God. He was fully God. But most of all, the biggest thing that he knew was on that cross when he was standing there being that sacrificial lamb for you and for me. When he was on that cross... When that sin, when all our sin came upon him, he knew his heavenly father would turn his eyes away because the heavenly father cannot look upon sin. And we see that in Matthew 27, 46, where he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew out of each of the gospels, Luke records one additional thing the other Gospels did not. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke them. 
And Jesus said, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. First of all, I want to draw your attention to, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The Pharisees hated the idea of Jesus receiving this attention. And he told Jesus' Jesus's disciples to rebuke him. And Jesus said, if, if, if I keep quiet, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. The true meaning of Christ's entrance into Jerusalem was being missed by everyone. You see, the disciples saw Jesus as the Messiah, but they didn't understand that he was about to be put to death for their sins. They didn't understand the magnitude of what that meant. The people were looking for a deliverer from Roman persecution, a Messiah that would come and save them politically, not spiritually. The Pharisees saw Jesus as a heretic. How dare he claim to be the Messiah, to have this immense following, to draw attention from themselves. And what they saw to be the law is not the grace that Jesus taught. They did not understand that their celebration of Jesus would turn into words crying out, crucify him. With Jesus going into Jerusalem, with all the things that Jesus knew that people were going to do to him, when he knew that the people who were closest to him would deny him, when he knew that the people who were saying Hosanna and praising him as he was going into Israel, into Jerusalem, he looked over Jerusalem and you know what he did? He wept. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you even, you had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? And now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus wasn't weeping for what he was about to endure. He wasn't weeping for himself. He was weeping for what was going to happen to Jerusalem in 70 AD, 40 years later, 40 years later, the Romans, three days before the Passover, were going to walk into Jerusalem. They were going to surround the city and they were going to destroy it. Titus, who is going to become the emperor of Rome, not only destroyed it, but over a million people were killed. And the Bible tells us that not one stone was left on top of the other. That's how vicious, vicious the war was. Jesus saw what was going to happen to Jerusalem. He didn't weep for himself. He wept for what was going to happen to the people of Israel. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. This morning, many of us have heard the Easter story quite a few times. And some of you may never have heard the Easter story or you didn't understand the relevance of the Easter story. Do you realize that Jesus, the one thing that God cannot do is mess with our free will? That when we were created, we were created in the image of God and we were created with the ability to choose. And God will never, ever take that away from you. 
Revelation 3.20 says, here I am. I'm right here. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The question is, why doesn't he just save us? Why doesn't he just make it all go away? Why doesn't he just come in and save us? Because he's given you and me a choice, whether to serve him or not to serve him. Billy Graham says, you have a will of your own. That is how he made you. He made you in his image. You can reject him. You can go to your grave rejecting Christ, and there is nothing that God can do about it. And as with Jerusalem, he will do everything in his power to warn you. He will do everything in his power to bring incidents across your path to stop you. But he will not trespass on your will. Your right to choose. This morning, we have the knowledge of what Christ has done for you, done for us. And we know why he entered the gates. The disciples didn't have that knowledge. They, they didn't understand what the next day's held. But we do. We see the story. We know what has happened. We know he goes to the cross for our sins. I'm going to call the worship team forward now. I'm just going to challenge you this morning that this Easter, this story is more than a story. It's life-changing. It is a time where Jesus went to the cross, not for himself. He didn't enter Jerusalem for himself. He didn't go through all these things for himself. He endured all of this for you, knowing full well what he was going to go through. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And Jerusalem did not recognize Jesus. This morning, we don't sit here as bystanders. We don't sit here not knowing the price he paid on that cross. This week, this holy week, this price was paid for you and for me. You see, nothing about this week was about him. Everything about this week was about you. Everything he endured, everything he knew, all the feelings he felt, all the abandonment he felt, the agony was about you. Because he knew that by going to the cross, he was going to take your sins and my sins. And he was going to give us the gift of life. You may be here this morning and you don't know what it means to be a Christian. You don't know what it means to give your life to Jesus. You don't know what it means when Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open that door, I will come in. What that means is that Jesus, Jesus died on the cross for you. Palm Sunday was the beginning of a week where he went through so that you and I could be safe from our sins. You see, someone who was perfect, who became the sacrificial lamb for you and I, he took your sin and my sin so that we had no sin, that gave us the ability to be able to go to heaven, to be with God. We will live eternally. Our bodies will die, our souls will not. We have a choice of where we want to spend eternity. You see, God will never take the free will away from us. It is our right to choose. This morning, you might not know Jesus. And you might want to know him more. You might want to understand what Jesus, this price that Jesus paid for you. And what it means to fully give your life to Jesus. And then there's you here this morning who... 
might have heard the story like myself over and over and you just want that refreshing in your heart. You want it to be real again. You want to know him. You just want to come up and you just want to say, Jesus, I just want to know you. You know, the altars are going to be open this morning. The band is going to sing. I want to encourage you. As Jesus walked into the city of Jerusalem, come and meet him today. If you want to, people are here to pray with you. If you want to come and just spend some time with Jesus. I want these altars to be open. I want it to be sacred for him. Why don't we sing that final song, King of Kings. And if you want prayer this morning, you want to give your life to Jesus, or you just want to come and refresh your heart for this beautiful Easter week, come on forward.